Welcome, welcome, welcome to the issue. My name is Babu Biko, the tallest man from my village. And we have a good show lined up for you today. And you know what? On this show, a lot of times we usually start with Donald Trump or Rodrigo Duterte. You know, at this rate, we might as well just add Donald Trump and Rodrigo, Rodrigo Duterte in our credits as content creators. But I mean, the world can't simply revolve around these two people. So guys, thank you for your service. We have used you enough. Goodbye, we are never using you again. <clears throat> so today, we are going to start with... Really, guys? Really? <sighs> Rodrigo Duterte. Fine. What did De Gong do this time? So, you can go to hell. Mr. Obama, you can go to hell. I'm sorry, did he just tell President Obama to go to hell? So, you can go to hell. Mr. Obama, you can go to hell. Oh, P. Didi, the gift that keeps on giving. So, apparently, President Obama criticized how President Duterte has so far killed close to 3,000 drug-related criminals summarily. Uh, which seems like the possible plot to Narcos season three. Just putting it out there. And the drug offensive by President Duterte is so strong that drug lords have reported to pretend to die in order to survive. Now again, I mean, I'm still on the gray area with the enigma that is President Rodrigo Duterte. And I also want to stay on his good side if I ever want a visa to the Philippines. But let me tell you something, sir. Just keep the verbal diarrhea going. The issue would be nowhere without people like you. Uh, quickly, we move on to the African scene where, again, another supporting cast of the issue, Big Bob, has come back for a cameo. Last week, President Mugabe appointed his son-in-law, Mr. Simba Chikore, to be the second in command in the state-owned Air Zimbabwe. Uh, I am saddened that unlike Kenyans on Twitter or KOT, ZOT, which I assume is Zimbabweans on Twitter, they didn't start the hashtag RIP Air Zimbabwe. And <clears throat> now that we all agree that they are called ZOT, which sounds like something a superhero will say, it sounds like, I will ZOT you to death. Sorry, I digress. Where were you? Yes. Uh, so far, no one saw the interview. I doubt people even knew there were interviews and no professional qualifications have been put forward to justify the appointment. So they basically made the appointment the way Mufasa chose Simba to be the Lion King. By the way, RIP Mufasa. Hashtag never forget. Anyway, Air Zimbabwe had debts worth over $300 million, which I assume in Zimbabwean currency is like a to Brazilian dollars and the government promised to help them with that debt. I don't think anyone in Air Zimbabwe expected that this was the help they were going to get. In Kenyan news, uh, Capsaret MP Honorable Oscar Sudi was last week accused of forging his diploma certificates and weirdly not a lot of Kenyans were surprised by this. I think as Kenyans, we have gotten a little too comfortable with our politicians getting in scandals. Right now, if a politician wants to shock Kenyans, he might as well just speak the truth. That will blow us away. Uh, so, Honorable Sudi was charged with nine counts of forgery. Now, let's just stop there, ladies and gentlemen, and analyze this. Forging a diploma is like... It's like Arsenal scouting their own Champions League trophy. Sooner or later, someone is going to find out it's a fake. But then again, for years, no one knew that Clark Kent was Superman, and all he was doing was taking out his glasses and squeezing himself into a bodysuit that seemed really sweaty and uncomfortable to walk in. So, what do I know? <laughs> we'll be right back.
Welcome back to The Issue. My name is Babu Biko, the tallest man from my village. And quickly, let's talk about the Kenyan education system, uh, which most people know as... Actually, there are only two other systems that have been able to withstand the, ravage, the ravages of time. And those are Madilu system and this one. System ya Kapungala. Papa Fololo, the king of Kapungala. The Kenyan education system has over the years faced a lot of criticism. But is this criticism really justified? Well, let's see. In the colonial era, classes were stratified on race. Uh, so blacks would be in their own classrooms and Asians in their own classrooms. With the risk of sounding like a race sommelier, am I the only one who perhaps thinks that Asians should have been left in their own classes? Because anyone who can do a quadratic equation of head should not be in the same class with someone who doesn't even know what a quadratic is. Then, after gaining independence, uh, you know, raising our awesome flag, singing our beautiful national anthem, and then forgetting the other two verses of the national anthem, the Ominde Commission came up with a new education system. And by the way, we searched for an image of the Ominde Commission, and this image of the rock popped up. So, the Ominde Commission came up with a new education system and called it the 7423. And by the way, earlier about the national anthem, that wasn't a joke. It's a tragedy that, for one, very few people can actually sing the whole national anthem, and two, that someone out there managed to convince all of us that E Mungu Nguvu Yetu is all God of all creations. It doesn't match. The 7423 system worked for a while, and any of you can ask your parents about this. And trust me, every parent supposedly passed their certificate of primary education. But the 7423 was not churning out skilled labor at the same pace that Kenya was developing. So there was a great deficiency. Then in 1985, Mtukufu Rais Daniel Toroitich Arap Moi implemented a Mackay report commissioned in 1982 and brought about the 844 system. And this is where the issue begins. The world seems to be in agreement that the 844 system is one of the toughest education systems in the world. The 844 system is basically like this. Actually, that's a lie, because Royal Rumble matches cannot even begin to match just how tough 844 is. It is cutthroat, and it has taught our students that being at the top of the class is all that matters. Uh, it does not matter how you do it or how many people you have to step on, the ultimate goal is for you to be the lone survivor at the top. When it first started, um, 844, like every new relationship we ever get into, brought a lot of promises with it. Um, it looked us in the eye, it bought us a promise ring, and promised that it will not be cramming oriented, that, that it will be different from our ex. Then it gave us some home science, and we thought, wow, this is new. Then, just to put the icing on the cake, it gave us a little arts and crafts, and we thought that we had found the love of our lives. Blinded by love, we married 844, not knowing that a few years in the, a few years in the relationship, 844 will rear its ugly head. Now, we are stuck here, disappointed, looking at the children we have born with 844, wondering why these children are not able to think creatively on their own, or why these kids lack basic life skills, or basically wondering why these kids think it's okay to write talk to you later on their CVs. 
844 was supposed to develop not only the mental side of the students, but also the mental aspects. And now it's failing miserably, and it has taken us 32 years to realize that. Let's start with some of the ridiculousness of the content in the curriculum. Now, I don't have any problem with mathematics. In fact, I wasn't that terrible in maths. I mean, I was terrible, but not that terrible. Up to now, I don't know whether this is pronounced loci or loci or loki. In class, uh, the teacher used to tell me that 5 plus 5 is equals to 10. And you can count and say that it really is 10. During the homework, I do a sum similar to that. Uh, they ask me, Mary has four cakes. She buys another four cakes. How many cakes does Mary have? First of all, I think... And I conclude that Mary, first of all, akonaminyo. Second of all, Mary will end up with diabetes. But then, 4 plus 4 is 8 cakes. Okay, I get it. Then, why do you come in the exam and ask me, Onyango has 3 apples, Wambui has 6 oranges. Calculate the speed at which the Malaysian plane was traveling in before it disappeared. Now, I exaggerate there, but... Tell me you have never come across a question that is so complex in an exam and your teacher keeps insisting that they taught you that before. Then there is that aspect of physical development <clears throat> or PE. Uh, most of us must have heard of this ancient mythical activity called PE. Uh, if you ever got to attend PE, well and good. You're one of the few lucky ones. As far as we were concerned, PE stood for primary English. In the wholesome development of a child, he or she needs to partake in a few physical exercises, which most of our teachers nowadays take as wasting time. Most of the time we sneaked out to PE, our teacher would cane us and then tell us that while we were busy jumping up and down, so and so school was busy studying and they will beat us in the exam. Which brings us to the biggest problem faced by the 844 system and that is drilling for exams. Students in lower primary wake up as early as 4 a.m. to go to school. And across the platform, students spend a lot of time cramming and recramming so much information, and the teachers are always on, ha on hand with a cane to make sure you are cramming in the right format to pass the exam. Let me give you a personal example. When I was in primary, half the time we were taught how to pass exams. We were even given tricks like, if you find something you don't know, there are ways of making an intelligent guess as to what could be the correct answer. And just to prove to you that our education system is like survivor, when someone knew something in class, or as we like to call them, chopiwa class, knew something, they were never going to share it with anyone else unless implored by the teacher. In fact, Nothing was annoying as much of your class. Okay, I was one of them. Whatever, it doesn't matter. It's not important to the story. Where was I? Yes. Teachers are not teaching us the content in the syllabus. They're just teaching us how to pass exams. And that sets the foundation for a domino role of failure. In high school, uh, there was this kid in our class who was absolutely brilliant in maths. Now, for explanation purposes, uh, let's call this boy uh, Johnny Bravo. So brilliant was he that he once corrected celebrated mathematician Professor Amadi. The problem with Johnny Bravo is that he was good in maths and physics, and that's about it. So, with the way that I am conditioned throughout my life, you know, how to pass exams and how to beat the competition, I studied Johnny Bravo. I was very good in languages and chemistry, so... I let Johnny Bravo have his time to shine in maths. But what I did was, I got a few topics in maths, which would appear in section B of the paper. You know, those worth 10 marks, like probability. And I would perfect them to ensure that even if Johnny Bravo beats me in maths, he doesn't beat me by far. And when it came to English, Kiswahili, and geography, I would whitewash Johnny Bravo. Therefore, ensuring throughout my, has throughout my high school life, that Johnny Bravo never beat me once. Do you see the flaw in this logic? For one, I came out of high school not knowing whether this is pronounced 
Losi or Losai or Loki. Can someone actually help me? The, how is this pronounced? Okay, now there's an argument in the control room. Okay. And two, if we continuously churn out young people whose sole intention is to beat the competition no matter the means, it is a tragic ending to a tragic story. Now, I'm not saying that competition is bad. But if you compete with someone to the extent that you do not want to show them how to do a quadratic equation, then that is no longer competition. It's stupidity. And you have been told over and over again that No man is an island No man stand alone But you don't hear. And this conditioning towards exam is present even at home. If your child comes home with a report card where he or she has moved from 200 marks to 250 marks, instead of congratulating their improvement and encouraging them, you still get angry at them as to why they came in position 10, asking them whether the other nine people are any different than they are. Drilling has actually resulted in more dangerous activities uh, teachers spend hours on end trying to get their students to cram the answers and students are actually doing something called batch processing. For example, if I know I have a geography paper tomorrow, I pick all the geography books from Form 1 to Form 4, read them all at once in one night, you know, complete with the whole put your feet in the bucket of cold water. And when the exam comes, I quickly dump all the information on paper before I forget. And once the papers are collected, I have no idea how a fold mountain forms. And before we go on, yes, I will steam geography. You history doers can just do your history. Though I believe that we should be making history, not reading about it. This cutthroat academia business is actually what has led to widespread cheating in our national exams. I mean, if you overlook the scores of other factors like corruption, mismanagement, greed, general stupidity, but that's a story for another day. And it, it has also been the reason for the recent spate of fires. Well, this is my theory. If you continuously table exams to students as a survival reality show, they will never be ready for those exams. That's why you see a lot of students keep reading and rereading their books until the very last minute when the exam paper is dropped on the table. So, if they're faced with a major exam, they will always feel unprepared. They have not crammed when the Devonshire White Paper was signed, or what is a glacier, or they don't know the mass number of magnesium. So, they end up resulting to measures that ensure that the exams are postponed. But you know what? That's just my theory. So, uh, now that we have clearly established that 844 system has not been the best education system, what solutions are the stakeholders looking into? <coughs> in the blue corner, weighing in at probably 70 kilograms, give or take, he had the mother of all weddings, according to some sources. Nat General Secretary William Socion. 844 is not a problem. 844 should remain as it is. But change the content. Integrate the changes within the structure. <laughs> okay, uh, I have to make an apology. I'm being told that his name is not William Socion, it's Wilson Socion, so <laughs> my apologies for that. Moving on, and in the red corner, weighing in at 200 kilograms, give or take, he has been called the Kenyan Magufuli, or rather Magufuli, has been called the Tanzanian Matiangi, Mr. Fred Matiangi. We are all focused on delivering on the assignment we have been given, and uh, I would not like to be distracted. Ooh, okay. Mr. Socion, rebuttal. Go slow. Tunaelewana? Go slow. Go slow. Usikimbie sana. Education is a delicate sector that involves 12 million children. Touche, touche, touche. Okay. Uh, Mr. Matiangi? I am happy that I'm engaging the, the Rio shoe wearers. I'm, I'm sorry, the what? The Rio shoe wearers. The, the what? The? 
Oh, the real, oh, the real shoe wearers. Okay, right, right, the real shoe wearers. Okay, continue. I am happy that I'm engaging the, the real shoe wearers, the head teachers who are managing our kids in school. So, the government has proposed a new education system called 2663, uh, which again comes with the promise of being more talent-oriented rather than cramming-oriented. They held a discussion over it a few months ago at the KICC, and I thought it would be a boring event till I saw Wilson Sosion there. I mean, <laughs> just look at him. Look at how lackluster he is. He's basically, uh, he's basically just sitting in the chair like, you guys know I could be planning another strike, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, the new system will see students spend two years in nursery, six years in primary, six years in secondary, and three years in university. And can I just take a moment to say thank goodness I didn't have to spend six years in secondary because two more years of organic chemistry and I would go crazy. The 2663 will see fewer subjects being taught and more practical skills. That is a plus because we cannot have a batch of students who are crammed with theory but cannot apply it. We cannot have students who know all of Newton's laws of motion but have not been shown how they will apply this in a real life situation. Secondly, students may finally get some essential PE time and get equipped with life skills. This may seem like a waste of time, but nothing is as important in a child's development as imparting life skills. Uh, it may be something as heavy as survival skill or as subtle as saying thank you or just giving up your seat to an elderly person. Things which most parents will agree are foreign to the generation of nowadays. But what I fully agree with the new system is the secondary system. Three years in junior secondary school and three in senior. In the senior segment, students are allowed to specialize in their preferred areas according to abilities or interest, which is an important aspect missing in the 844. Special specialization, ooh, I almost shrugged. Specialization not only allows for perfection of the art, it also reduces the scourge of having to be judged and ultimately brought down by subjects that are not your strong points. Uh, sort of like me and biology. I have to live with that on my results slip for the rest of my life. Take Johnny Bravo for example. You remember him? <clears throat> All Johnny Bravo wanted to be was a pilot. He passed maths and physics, but because he was not good in English, Kiswahili, geography, chemistry, biology, and agriculture, Johnny Bravo ended up not attaining the entry mark to university. He is a very skilled mathematician, not able to ply his trade because our education system is basically survival for those who are top 10. Now, I'm not saying that 844 system did not at least produce a few sharp individuals. I mean, there is me, uh, I know Jambo, and Njoki Chek. Okay, th th there is me and I know Jambo. Those are good examples that works. However, when people who have gone a complete education system and they still have to pay someone else to write a CV for them, then we have a big problem. 2663 still has some unanswered questions, especially as regards to funding. Proposals have been made for a larger budget allocation, uh, more borrowing from donors, and development partners, civil society, and non-governmental organization on paper are also willing to fund the system. In fact, private sector players such as Safaricom have taken a huge step in bringing a more talent, ap talent approach education in Kenya by pioneering the M-Pesa Foundation Academy. Yeah, M-Pesa Academy. Seriously, no better name. You couldn't even call it St. Colimo or St. Joseph. St. Joseph is taken. Anyway, the 2663 may present a logistical nightmare in terms of retraining some teachers and incorporating a new curriculum. And it may mean that parents have to dig deeper into their pockets for their child to go to school. But it may also mean that this country will actually produce people who have sharpened talents and who actually can reason out on their own. In a country where reasoning is at its all-time lowest. 
Therefore, I, Babu Biko, fully endorse the 2663. That's our show for today. My name is Babu Biko, the tallest man from my village. And today I'm going to give a shout out to our sound technician, Gideon Alan Kiplagat, aka the only Kalenjin who doesn't own a leather blonde jacket. Until tomorrow, remember, the best way to predict the future is to eat some pancakes and just drink some coffee and not worry too much about it. Babu Biko, 2016. Good night.